Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. Weimar Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level Ministries in the North Hills. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us today. Everybody, we're going to talk about sex and marriage. I said sex and marriage. Yes, I did. Okay, yeah. and we're, we've got, and we're going to start with a YouTube question, guys. And you know what? I just want to say this. YouTube is a great way to leave your questions at the C Cornerstone. There's a lot on there, so you should sign up for YouTube. But here comes a question through there. It says, uh, oh, it says, oh, we have, um, we have formal marriage ceremonies now, but I'd like to ask about those marriages in biblical times like Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel. How did, they, how did they get married in God's eyes? Did they have a formal ceremony or exchange of vows like we do now? Genesis 24, 67 talks about Isaac brought Rebecca into his tent and she became his wife. This confuses me, especially comparing to living together today. What about those couples who have lived together 10 years with children now? Are they sinning against God? What is the difference between Old Testament marriages in those times versus living together without marriage in our society? Wow, a lot to talk about there. Pastor Glaze, could you start us out? Yeah, I was gonna say that's a lot to unpack. But you know, when you look at the first marriage between Adam and Eve, God was there and it was an official recognition you know, they might not necessarily say, I, you know, I take you as my wife or I take you as my husband. But, you know, there was a acknowledgement mm -hmm. of a commitment to each other. Uh, so I think that, you know, when you look at the Bible, especially in those early times before, you know, you get into the Jewish ketubah and all that right. type of thing, that, you know, there was some type of uh, commitment. There was some type of acknowledgement. And even, uh, you know, the, the person points out uh, Isaac and Rebecca. And it's, it's almost like they're saying that they just kind of went into a tent, had sex, and they were married. But let me just share with you some of the things that happened before they did that. Mm -hmm. First of all, <clears throat> Abraham gave his servant a list of things that he was to look for for a wife for Isaac. The servant prayed for God's guidance. Uh, the servant talked to Laban, the father, mm -hmm. you know, and also paid a dowry. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of stuff that went on actually before they <laughs> before they slipped into the tent, right? Very formal stuff. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, it, it wasn't like, because I think one of the things that this uh, person is trying to point out, is it okay to just live together? Uh, and does that mean we're married if we live together for 10 years? You know, and they, they're pointing out Isaac and Rebecca. But again, there was a lot of things that went into that that showed a commitment uh, to each other. And it just wasn't, they went into the tent and had sex. Yeah. You know, in, in Psalms, I found this, uh, in Psalms 45, 14 through 15, it kind of gives you s some idea of, of, uh, of a type of, she shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, she be, she'll be brought to you with gladness. and re So there's, you, you see an idea of some type of ceremony. And, but we do have good rules, don't we, Dr. Ray, when it says in Genesis 2, 24, therefore a man shall... So we have the rules of a marriage. A man's going to leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and they both shall become one flesh. And then we see that in Genesis chapter 2. So we have rules of marriage. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. And there had to be, like Dr. Glaze said, a formal commitment. We know that just because the Bible doesn't give us, you know, the different customs uh, through the times or says... You, this is the marriage ceremony that thou shalt yeah. perform or something like that. Um, but we know Jesus went to a wedding feast at Cana. Yeah. You know, there was wine served to the point where they had run out. So there was a, this was a long feast. And we know that in Jewish custom, um, and we know this from all sorts of writings, that the wedding ceremony would mm -hmm. last about a week. And you, you get that. Uh, and he mentioned uh, Jacob and Rachel. And, and that's mentioned in Scripture when uh, Jacob worked for seven years to, yeah. to pay that dowry that you mentioned, yeah. because that was part of their custom. And then Laban, he gathered the men together, it says in, in Genesis 29, 22, and made a feast. And in the evening, he brings Leah. Of course, he's disguised yeah. Leah, and <laughs> Jacob doesn't know it. We know the story. But the next morning, Jacob finds out that it's Leah, and Laban says to her, to, or to Jacob, rather, <laughs> fulfill her week. 
and we will give you this one also if you serve me another seven years. The, the, the week was the marriage week. So for mm -hmm. the next six days, right. they continued to celebrate the marriage between Jacob and Leah. And then after that, they did another uh, wedding week. number two. Yeah. Wedding <laughs> number two. But, but, you know, so they did have customs. And the Bible says that uh, every matter shall be established by at least, you know, two or three witnesses. And we have that today. You have witnesses, a public ceremony. So all that has to happen. Uh, it can't just be like you said, you know, that you go into the tent and you sleep together and, oh, we're married in the eyes of God. That's nonsense. Amen. Right. Um, there has to be a formal commitment with, with witnesses. We are, you know, human beings. We have society. We have structures. And, and we need to respect those things. Yeah. And, and that was the going into the tent afterwards was right. after the ceremony, which you Amen. can't have a covenant without words. And in the Jewish... Ooh, ooh, say that again. You can't. you can't have a covenant without words. That's the commitment, right? That's exactly. The words, right. people say, why do I have to sign something to yeah. show my love? Well, that's the commitment, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so after they would do that, they would go in and what they would actually do, they would actually have a sheet under the woman and I don't need to be graphic yeah, about yeah, it, but yes, then they would yeah. bring it out and show the family that a blood covenant had yeah. just been cut. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why marriage can't be broken apart from death. So it's not just going in and have sex. Now I do believe this though, I know we don't have time to go into all this, but when you do come together with somebody, whether inside of a covenant or outside of a covenant, you do become one flesh. You're right. And then you do become tied well, to let, that person. Let me ask you about that. Let me ask you about living together. Cause they asked as a second part of this question, what about someone who's lived together? They've got kids, they've lived together for 10 years. I mean, isn't that marriage in the eyes of God? What about that? Because we need to address this because we see it so much. Almost everybody seems like lives together now before they get married. What about that, Dr. Glaze? Well, what should we say about that? Well, again, you know, you don't see a formal commitment in that. And I think that uh, Jay brought it out in, in that it's done in the public, you know, where there's two or three witnesses where other people see it. And so, you know, with, without that commitment before God, first of all, and then, you know, in the presence of others, you know, it's not to me, I, I, it's not legitimate. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, and, and to use the term today, it's just shacking up. Right. And, and, and where, where, where is the honoring of God in that commitment? Where, you know what I mean? Uh, where is, you know, that that you really not only honoring of God, but honoring of God in your marriage. In other words, we're saying, God, I, I have a better idea. I have a better way. And uh, well, the question I would always ask, I'd re re retort back to them and say, if they're, we've been together 10 years and we got a family, I said, well, why haven't you gotten married then? Because somewhere, if I can get in there and put them on my couch, I'm going to pull something out. Yeah. Somebody's afraid of the commitment. Somebody's done something. Somebody's not willing to go all the way in. So that lets me know, too, you're not all the way in. Yeah. And that means you know you still can get out. Maybe 10 years, but you're still not all the way in. And that's, that's a red flag for me. Yeah, yeah that's a good and point. Didn't you bring up some, some I, I know we've, this question we've answered before, that the divorce rate for those who live together is, right. is yeah. higher? It's, a couple it, years ago, you. Right. The, the, as a matter of yeah. fact, the, the more a person is divorced, the higher the yep. divorce rate is, you know, for the next marriage. So, yeah, there's a lot to be said about, you know, shacking up before you get married. Well, it's interesting that, that I thought you're laughing there, Jay. I don't know. <laughs> <Shacking up. laughs> that's the old, that's the old, shacking old, up old generation <laughs> there. But I thought of the woman at the well and how she was, you know, um, yeah. uh, he said, bring your husband. And then he says, the person you're living with now isn't your husband. Your husband yeah. And it's like living together didn't make make that that's guy right. her husband, right. you know. Yeah. So we'll moving on to the next uh, good okay. question, a lot to it. Let's go to an audio question on marriage. What I'm wondering is, is that if one does not consummate their marriage, are they really blessed by God? Are they to continue in that marriage? And what is God's view on this? I know Corinthians 7 says that if one chooses to stay with their partner, they do no wrong. But at the same time, spiritually, how is that one being affected? Or should I say both being affected by these decisions? Thank you. Okay, that's a really a, a different kind of question for us, Jay. I, there's a, I bet there's a couple of different angles that people are going to tackle with that. I think one of the things, though, is that First Corinthians 7, I wonder if she may be taking that a little bit out of context right, right. Uh, because it's not talking about whether or not someone should consummate their marriage or not. It's talking about if they're an unbeliever and they're already married, right. should the believer depart from them? 
should they leave? And it's saying it's up to them on whether or not they choose to stay or go, but they're not under bondage in that case. So it's talking about that there. Uh, so I think that putting that in with the consummation piece, uh, I don't believe that's what it's talking about. But the fit right there. It, it, yeah. it doesn't, no. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to say that there. But then with the consummation part, uh, my question would be, if, what if somebody gets married but they couldn't consummate? You know, it doesn't mean that they're not blessed by God based upon the sexual piece. I think you have to go a little bit deeper and find out why is the marriage not being consummated? Right. Yeah. What's going on? What's the root issue? I don't think it's just about consummation. I think it's really the why, not just the how or the what in that situation. So I'll leave with that because I know these gentlemen probably want to get in on that as well. <laughs> yeah, right. And I, I'm not 100% familiar, but I believe there is some Roman Catholic uh, dogma that says something about the marriage and the consummation uh, and that that needs to take place for the marriage to actually be official. So maybe she's get coming from that angle. But, but um, you know, to build off of what Jay said, sex in marriage is commanded. So it's something that we're commanded to do. Um, that's very clear in 1 Corinthians 7. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. Likewise, also the wife to her husband. But, you know, there could be something that would hinder that, an injury or something like that, or maybe going into it. They know that, you know, they're not able to have sex yeah. due to injury or birth defect or something like that. So it, I don't think it's something that it's, it's necessary. But if if you're healthy and there's nothing wrong with you, you are commanded to come together intimately, regularly. Um, the book of Hebrews says marriage is honorable among all and the bed, undefiled. and it actually, it's a word for intercourse, intercourse is undefiled. Uh, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. To go back to our previous question, yeah, you know, yeah. sex outside of marriage, whether you've been living together for 10, 20 years, doesn't matter, it's still a sin. But in marriage, it's commanded, and it's beautiful and it's good, but it's not everything. If, you know, something happens, age, injury, I mean, that doesn't end the marriage. Let me ask this, and maybe I'll move to this side too. Why does God do that? Why does he say it has to be inside of marriage? Was he doing a, you know, put a, a, a stop all the fun everybody's having? Everywhere? Why does sex have to be within marriage? Well, I, I believe that there's protection, you know, within marriage. You know, for instance, you know, people that just go and move from partner to partner, they open themselves up for all type of uh, uh, STDs. And not only that, but I believe that there's a soul connection, yes. you know, that when, and, and Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that when you're joined to a harlot, that it's, it's more than just joining physically. I believe that a part of your person is joined too. And so I believe God put that in there, you know, uh, again, for our protection so that we're not passing, you know, part of us onto others that we're not willing to make a lifetime commitment with. Yeah. Again, they become one. The moment a man right. and a woman experience uh, the, the blissness of, of intimacy, they, they become one. Yeah. It's amazing, uh, Ray, uh, guys, that even there are certain animals out there that will mate for life. Eagles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, really. Oh yeah, they'll I mean, make for life. There was, never... These guys are experts. Uh, yeah. 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 No, it, yeah, the doves yeah. and yeah. eagles. Yeah. 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 What is that? A and, thorn, and, a <laughs> anyway, I, I appreciate that. It, and it, it's it's interesting, isn't it? That um, you know we uh, we I've heard it said that when there is some people say, well, you got to have this experience. How do you know if it's going to work? Right. That that can cause hardness. It actually can cause hardness. You think it's going to work, but actually can have the opposite effect. Well, we're going to take a, a quick break. And then after the break, we have a viewer asked, does God care about my sexuality? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Hard Questions. We've been talking about sex and marriage. Very interesting and very important discussion for our society today. So let's go to the next question. And uh, it says, does God care about my sexuality? Does God care about my sexuality? Pete. I think without a doubt. You know, when you, you know, he created us. Uh, there's a, there's a, a number of great books out there intended for pleasure, pleasure by Dr. Wheatley. But in, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, it says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of you, youth as a loving deer and a grace of, graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Uh, and, and again, what was brought out Pretty just a racy. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, I, I think romantic. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and yeah. I'm not you know, no, trying I'm to just... be super spiritual, but I understand what you're saying. Um, and then, you know, 
Uh, if I'm correct, I, I think if you read the book of Song of Solomon, I think a man was not allowed to read that till he was 30 years old. And if you really take a look at the Song of Solomon, that is really talking about uh, a love affair between a man and, and her husband. And so God cares about our sexuality. I really believe he does. And for those who are watching and, and may be having some difficulties, I would highly recommend Tim, Tim and Beverly LaHaye's book, The Act of Marriage. I tell you what, it's an old, you can get it on Amazon. I'm sure it's just a couple bucks now. I, I think there's millions and millions in print. The, we, Elaine and I insist, every couple we do, we insist that they buy the book. And it's amazing, they, they go out and buy it. We right? had to read that at seminary. Did you read it? The Act of Marriage. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you think? It was, it was fantastic. Yeah, it? it was very good. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Ray, what's your take on this? Um, uh, I don't know, like in a certain sense, I don't know what the question means, like right. sexuality. What does that even mean nowadays? Um, but, you know, I mean, I think Pete stated it. God made us in his image. Part of being in his image is being male and female. God says that. Genesis 1, 26, let God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and then let him have dominion, etc. And then, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. By the way, that's the first time we get in the Bible mentioned male and female, even though we know, we assume the Bibles or the animals were made that way. It never says that never says male and female until mankind is created. And so being male or female is essential to being in the image of God. And everybody is unchangeably one of those things. No matter what you do, no matter what someone tells you, no matter what, God forbid, permanently altering surgery you might get, every cell in your body is XX or XY, except for the one in every several thousand birth defects where you know, that can get messed up, but that's a birth defect. Yeah. We are still male or female. It's part of our being in the image of God because as we looked at last time, the two become one. Right. Just as God is one being, three persons, so one man, one woman become one flesh and from that proceeds a third person completing sort of the human trinity when you, know, when you think about it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have that commitment because when we prostitute ourselves or when we treat sex as for pleasure, we're saying this is what God is like. You know, God is unholy. God is corrupt. And because that image is God when we're in uh, that marriage that, that um, God designed for that kind of love. So, so, let's, uh, so Jay, God cares about our sexuality. And again, I agree with what Ray said is that so much of that, that word is so loaded with so many meanings right now. What's your take on this? You know, I think that uh, when it comes to that, the Bible's full of how he cares about it. That's why he created it. If he didn't care about it, he wouldn't have created it. He created it for us. He created it for uh, within the confines of marriage for pleasure. Right. He created it uh, to procreate. He created it also for uh, even comfort. We take a look how when Isaac lost his mother, said he went in and he was comforted by his wife mm -hmm. uh, as a result for comfort. Uh, there's a healing. You know, Marvin Gaye had it right. You know, there is a healing that happens uh, when you come together with your spouse. Oh, I don't know where we're going here, everybody. But, I mean, in all honesty, though, I mean, there is a healing that takes place. Like if you have a conflict with your spouse and you come together. You know, it's amazing how people say, does God care about it? Of course he does. That's why he put the parameters around it that's because right. it's meant right. to be operated in a certain way, in a certain facet. In a safe area, right? In a safe area. And I think it's important as well that uh, if you notice when you're dating, I don't know how it was with you guys, but my wife and I, we talk about it all the time. When we were dating, the devil would always try to, he'd want to tempt you to come together. Mm -hmm. But then when you're married, if you get into disagreement, it's hard to come together sometimes <laughs> because the devil knows there's a blessing in coming together the way that God created it to be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, good, good point. Dr. Glaze. Well, you know, I, I, I'll just look at it from the natural perspective. You know, uh, why did God give a man the body parts that he gave to the man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and why did he give the woman the body parts that he gave? You know, I think, that, you know, the message that he's saying is that I created you distinct so that, and, and going back to the verse that you read in, in Proverbs, so that you can come together and enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that there's a certain amount of enjoyment. And, and to me, when two people of the same sex come together, that's a perversion of that enjoyment. And, and so definitely, you know, we, God created us, you know, as, as sexual individuals. And, and as Ray said, that's why he created somebody, one a male and one a female. So, okay. yeah, I think he, he cares about it. You know, he cares so much that he created them right. distinctly different. So and the and short answer is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God and, cares. And, and some of the outlines like Ray brought out too, is that defraud, not one another. So yeah. there's a time that, you know, 
uh, a wife may need her husband's love or a husband may need, and that's where, you know, and I highly recommend, there are so many fantastic marriage seminars all across the country, and I highly recommend that. I think a couple should go to one at least once a year. Yeah. Yeah, very, good. Tuna. very good, very good uh, counsel there. Well, coming up next, we ask, are there biblical teachings that are outdated? Wow, we'll be right back. I think this is a really interesting question coming up next. Are there any biblical teachings <laughs> which you think are old or outdated or can be ignored. And they gave one example, I thought of some other ones, but head covering, you know, head covering for women. Um, Ray, help us out here. Um, well, I'm gonna say on the one hand, there's nothing in the Bible that's old, there's nothing in the Bible that's outdated, and there's nothing in the Bible that can be ignored. I get like, scared even saying that, oh yeah, yeah, it's God's word, but I can ignore it. Uh, that's just not the way to ask this question. Are there things in the Bible that are ceremonial, typical, symbolical, things that were fulfilled that are not to be repeated? Absolutely. But that's not the same thing as saying, oh, it's outdated because we got to do what's new and what's hip. Um, that's not the way we live our Christian lives. We do what the Word of God says, and uh, it doesn't matter how old it is. And so, you know, they, they give the example of head coverings in, um, in yeah. Corinthians. Um, and, I, and I think the idea of, of that, uh, on the one side, the custom of the way they were doing certain things and the fact that harlots were, were bald a lot of times and Paul didn't want them to be like harlots, but there was still... There was still a principle even there that Paul said that men are not to look like women and women are not to dress like men, that that's an abomination. And, you know, I would go back to certain, you know, things in the Old Testament where we would see, for example, Deuteronomy 22 is a great place where someone might say something like this, but that's really the wrong way to describe it. When you build a new house... When you, th then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring blood guilt mm -hmm. on your household if anyone falls from it. Well, we understand they would go on their roofs, it's mm -hmm. cooler up there in the, in the hot climate. And so, you, you know, it was commanded to build a fence. Now, nobody's going to build a fence and around building, their roof today. They're building codes, yeah. building codes right but, there. But you do have to build a fence around your pool mm -hmm. in a lot of places right. because of the same it's reason, because of the same principle. There's a danger to human life. And so while uh, the... The, uh, the, the actual working out of that principle may change. Um, there are other things that are usually based on it, some principle. And let me just give you one other example. I know everybody wants to talk, but, you know, where he says things like, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey. You shall not wear a garment of different uh, sorts, such as wool and linen. There were reasons for those things, too that they were showing forth, again, the purity of the Messiah who was to come from them. There were all sorts of kinds of, you know, commandments where, again, we would see, see typical or, or, or symbolical or ceremonial. Jesus is going to fulfill that someday, right? We don't yeah. still sacrifice animals at a no. temple and pour out blood a certain way and sprinkle it a certain way and put it on your big toe and, uh, because Jesus fulfilled all those things. You know, and I, I appreciate that. I'd like to maybe dive a little more into the New Testament, though, because we're living our lives in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that we don't do that are in, like, greet one another with a holy kiss. Although in the 70s, you never, it was all any, anything goes. But what about that, Pastor Glaze? Well, I, I think that, you know, even that example, there's a principle that's in it. Right. And, and right. the principle might be not, <laughs> not to kiss somebody, yeah. but there should be some type of, type of formal greeting. You know, whether it's a handshake, whether it's a hug, you know, whether I, you know, put my hand on somebody's back. And I think that what that does is show uh, a, a bonding, a fellowship, a connection as far as us being brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, my dad invited a guy from the mill, the steel mill, up to uh -huh. church one day. And the guy greeting him at the door, this is the middle of the charismatic movement, you know, yeah. he, he gave him a big hug, kissed him on the cheek. The guy walked right around, walked back out of the church, okay? <laughs> you don't kiss a steel worker on the cheek. I'm sorry. It just doesn't go that way, okay? <laughs> I, I have a couple men in my church, and they love Jesus. They really do. And they're happily married. I got to say that. But, 
They, every Sunday morning, they greet me with a kiss on the cheek, and I told them, you kiss me one more time, I want dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and praise the Lord, that guy came to the Lord eventually, yeah, yeah, and it was, yeah. was a, you know, give me your, your you, thoughts on you this, know, I one thing, Let me go to the head covering piece. Um, I think with every message, there's a method of how it's carried out. And uh, the head covering piece was all about a sign of being submitted as a wife. Um, do I think a head covering would even be wrong today? Not at all. I'm not saying women should do it. I'm saying the method behind the method, the method of how it was carried out was being submitted. It was a sign of submission. Right, right. And that's what we need to, we have to look inside of every message and make sure that we don't lose the context, context the of why it was there, the and, principle. And, 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 and we don't do it for the sake of just because it, it was done before. In other words, right. we don't get into ritualism and... I exactly. think one of the one of the uh, more modern versions translates uh, one, oh, greet one another with holy kisses with a hearty handshake or something, <laughs> you know, which is pretty far from the literal translation. But you know, uh, good discussion. There's other things. I think uh, I think Ray said the key word: don't ignore the scriptures. Don't don't use that word about ignore. Understand them. Well, we like to end the program with the scripture, and today we go to First Corinthians, where it says this: food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 13. Everything in scripture is something that God wants you to know about. Study it, don't ignore it, learn what he wants you to know. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program and we want to hear from you. You can email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or you can call into our hotline at 412-349-4326.